Part Eight of The Highest Treason. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Highest Treason by Randall Garrett. Part Eight. The End and Epilogue. Hold it! The voice bellowed thunderingly from the loudspeakers of the six earth ships that had boxed in the derelict. Hold it! Don't bomb that ship! I'll personally have the head of any man who damages that ship! In five of the ships, the commander simply held off the bombardment that would have vaporized the derelict. In the sixth, Major Thornton, the group commander, snapped off the microphone. His voice was shaky as he said, that was close. Another second, and we'd have lost that ship forever. Captain Varensky's oriental features had a half-startled, half-puzzled look. I don't get it. You grabbed that mic control as if you'd been bitten. I know that she's only a derelict. After that burst of 50G acceleration for 15 minutes, there couldn't be anyone left alive on her. But there must have been a reason for using atomic rockets instead of their anti-acceleration fields. What makes you think she's not dangerous? I didn't say she wasn't dangerous, the Major snapped. She may be, probably is, but we're going to capture her if we can. Look! He pointed at the image of the ship in the screen. She wasn't spinning now, or looping end over end. After fifteen minutes of high acceleration, her atomic rockets had cut out, and now she moved serenely at constant velocity, looking as dead as a battered tin can. "'I don't see anything,' Captain Varensky said. "'The Karothic symbols on the side!' Palatal, unvoiced, sibilant, rounded. "'I don't read Karothic, Major,' said the captain. "'I—' Then he blinked and said, "'Shutos!' That's it, the Shudos of Karoth, the flagship of the Karothai fleet. The look in the Major's eyes was the same look of hatred that had come into the Captain's. Even if its armament is still functioning, we have to take the chance, Major Thornton said. Even if they're all dead, we have to try to get the Butcher's body. He picked up the microphone again. Attention, group. Listen carefully and don't get itchy trigger fingers. That ship is the Shudos, the butcher's ship. It's a ten-man ship, and the most she could have aboard would be thirty, even if they jammed her full to the hull. I don't know of any way that anyone could be alive on her after fifteen minutes at fifty Gs of atomic drive, but remember that they don't have any idea of how our counteraction generators damp out spatial distortion, either. Remember what Dr. Pendrick said. No man is superior to any other in all ways. Every man is superior to every other in some way. We may have the counteraction generator, but they may have something else that we don't know about, so stay alert. I am going to take a landing party aboard. There's a reward out for the butcher, and that reward will be split proportionately among us. It's big enough for us all to enjoy it, and we'll probably get citations if we bring him in. I want ten men from each ship. I'm not asking for volunteers. I want each ship commander to pick the ten men he thinks will be least likely to lose their heads in an emergency. I don't want anyone to panic and shoot when he should be thinking. I don't want anyone who had any relatives on Houston's world. Sorry, but I can't allow vengeance yet. We're a thousand miles from the Shudos now. Close in slowly until we're within a hundred yards. The boarding parties will don armor and prepare to board while we're closing in. At a hundred yards we stop, and the boarding parties will land on the hull. I'll give further orders then. One more thing. I don't think our AA generators could possibly be functioning, judging from that dent in our hull. But we can't be sure. If she tries to go into AA drive, she is to be bombed no matter who is aboard. It is better that sixty men die than that the butcher escape. All right, let's go. Move in. Half an hour later, Major Thornton stood on the hull of the Shudos, surrounded by the sixty men of the boarding party. Anybody see anything through those windows? he asked. Several of the men had peered through the direct vision ports, 
playing spotlight beams through them. "'Nothing alive,' said a sergeant, a remark which was followed by a chorus of agreement. "'Pretty much of a mess in there,' said another sergeant. "'That fifty G's mashed everything to the floor. "'Why'd anyone want to use acceleration like that?' "'Let's go in and find out,' said Major Thornton. The outer door to the airlock was closed, but not locked. It swung open easily to disclose the room between the outer and inner doors. Ten men went in with the Major, the others stayed outside with orders to cut through the hole if anything went wrong. "'If he's still alive,' the Major said, "'we don't want to kill him by blowing the air. Sergeant, start the airlock cycle.' There was barely room for ten men in the airlock. It had been built big enough for the full crew to use it at one time, but it was only just big enough. When the inner door opened, they went in cautiously. They spread out and searched cautiously. The caution was unnecessary, as it turned out. There wasn't a living thing aboard. Three officers shot through the head, sir,' said the sergeant. "'One of them looks like he died of a broken neck, but it's hard to tell after that fifty G's mashed him. Crewmen in the engine room, five of them, mashed up, but I'd say they died of radiation since the shielding on one of the generators was ruptured by the blast that made that dent in the hole. Nine bodies, the major said musingly. All Kurothai, and all of them probably dead before the 50G acceleration. Keep looking, sergeant. We've got to find that tenth man. Another twenty-minute search gave them all the information they were ever to get. No earth food aboard, said the Major. One space suit missing. Hand weapons missing. Two emergency survival kits and two medical kits missing. And, most important of all, the courier boat is missing. He bit at his lower lip for a moment, then went on. Outer airlock door left unlocked. Three Kurothai shot after the explosion that ruined the AA drive and before the 50G acceleration. He looked at the sergeant. What do you think happened? He got away, the tough-looking noncom said grimly. Took the courier boat and scooted away from here. Why did he set the timer on the drive then? What was the purpose of that 50G blast? To distract us, I'd say, sir. While we were chasing this thing, he hightailed it out. He might have at that, the Major said musingly. A one-man courier could have gotten away. Our new detection equipment isn't perfect yet. But... At that moment, one of the troopers pushed himself down the corridor toward them. Look, sir! I found this in the pocket of the carrot skin who was taped up in there. He was holding a piece of paper. The Major took it, read it, then read it aloud. Greetings, fellow Earthmen. When you read this, I will be safe from any power you may think you have to arrest or punish me. But don't think you are safe from me. There are other intelligent races in the galaxy, and I'll be around for a long time to come. You haven't heard the last of me. With love, Sebastian McMain. The silence that followed was almost deadly. He did get away, snarled the sergeant at last. Maybe, said the major, but it doesn't make sense. He sounded agitated. Look, in the first place, how do we know the courier boat was even aboard? They've been trying frantically to get word back to Caroth. Does it make sense that they'd save this boat? And why all the fanfare? Suppose he did have a boat. Why would he attract our attention with that 50G flare? Just so he could leave us a note? What do you think happened, sir? The sergeant asked. I don't think he had a boat. If he did, he'd want us to think he was dead, not the other way around. I think he set the drive timer on this ship, went outside with his supplies, crawled up a drive tube, and waited until that atomic rocket blast blew him into plasma. He was probably badly wounded and didn't want us to know that we'd won. That way we'd never find him. 
There was no belief on the faces of the men around him. "'Why'd he want to do that, sir?' asked the sergeant. "'Because as long as we don't know, he'll haunt us. "'He'll be like Hitler or Jack the Ripper. "'He'll be an immortal menace instead of a dead villain who could be forgotten.' "'Maybe so, sir,' said the sergeant, "'but there was an utter lack of conviction in his voice. "'But we'd still better comb this area and keep our detectors hot. "'We'll know what he was up to when we catch him.' But if we don't find him, the Major said softly, we'll never know. That's the beauty of it, Sergeant. If we don't find him, then he's won. In his own fiendish, twisted way, he's won. If we don't find him, said the Sergeant stolidly, I think we'd better keep a sharp eye out for the next intelligent race we meet. He might find him first. Maybe said the Major very softly. That's just what he wanted. I wish I knew why. The End The End of the Highest Treason by Randall Garrett